So coming to a main part of this course, it is about network and distribution. And the goal of the three hours of uh, network, as you see in the schedule, uh, or is to uh, transfer this network thinking to you. Uh, and you will uh, implement an example, the platoon uh, control also in, uh, in the lab. It is a simple or one of the simplest uh, network systems, but you will see that it is uh, not that simple at all uh, because of the network. The network uh, gives uh, degrees of freedom, but at the same time brings challenges with it. Um, I want to use today's lecture and tomorrow's lecture to raise your attention to, uh, to these challenges and how uh, we can deal with them. Um, yeah, I will use these two lectures also to mention some open points in research for you if you are at the beginning of your PhD and want to uh, suggest a topic for, for your advisor, then you have the opportunity to catch a topic today or tomorrow. Okay, let us start. Yeah, this was the introduction and I jumped over the optimization part and left it to Friday uh, because uh, yeah, the optimization part is uh, more advanced for the lab optima for the lab exercises and you will not need it. Uh, that's why I chose to um, to put it on Friday. And now network and distribution. Here we see again the lab architecture and where can we use uh, a network and uh, and distribution. And you could imagine in the coordination and decision making uh, part. And especially in the coordination, but we ha will have a combination of coordination and decision making in the framework of uh, MPC. So here are some or uh, one related literature. There are uh, also further literature you can find. Uh, also, I I did a survey on uh, a network. MPC, especially on network MPC, uh, which you can find in my thesis. But this is uh, a book. Uh, it is the result of a priority program in Germany. But there you will find in general uh, information about network dynamic systems, not especially on MPC. MPC is part of the book. And a new book uh, appeared two years ago, uh, written by Professor Lunzel, his famous control engineering professor in Germany. Um, and he writes really good books. Uh, they are really understandable. Uh, network control of multi-agent systems. But again, it's not about MPC at all. It is in general about uh, network multi-agent systems. And MPC is not uh, part of this book at all. It introduces just uh, basic concepts of network uh, control of multi-agent systems like consensus and synchronization of uh, agents. So and for the literature, yeah, what I'm going to tell you today, you can uh, find here. Uh, yeah, this one is also part of the first literature. 
but this was the paper related to to it and actually here in these three literature you find uh, applications of uh, of one the first one is about uh, post control uh, actually it is about uh, going to, to a formation. I'll, I'll show you a video, I think, during this course um, to, today or tomorrow. So go to formation uh, is a general problem in, in robotics or in uh, network vehicles. We, we have a number of vehicles at arbitrary starting poses. And we define goal poses, and they have to coordinate each other or to coordinate with each other to reach their goal positions, uh, of course, without colliding with each other and as fast as possible or as efficient as possible, and so on. Now, the second one is about intersection uh, management using networked MPC. I think. One of you told me yesterday that uh, he or she is working on. Uh, yes, it's me actually. Shao, yeah? yeah. Yeah. He will find uh, a work of us. Uh, then, yeah, the third one, yeah, is, uh, yeah, actually interesting because. Uh, yeah, it is about racing control. It is more um, a hobby of us than a project. I'll also show you some videos of it. Yeah, again, uh, as in control and optimization, the code is available. You can download it, um, get it running. Um, maybe a hint on the on this code for running. So it is. Uh, written in an older version of MATLAB and uh, I use their CPLEX as an optimization library. Maybe you have to get uh, to fix some, uh, if you use an, a new MATLAB version or, or don't have CPLEX, you have to get it for academic uh, purposes. It is uh, for free. And maybe you have to fix some uh, some errors regarding to um, update of MATLAB. Okay, so we start with a definition of network systems. Actually, we uh, I showed this definition also in relation or in in the introduction. Uh, as a definition of network vehicles, it is again the same, are also connect, called connected. But here in general, we say we, uh, we assume that we have communications. This is an important point in, in this uh, lecture that we assume communications. So it uh, consists of interacting systems and yeah, why we network systems because we want to have better perception and better decision making. And again, the focus of our course is on decision making. But at, as I remember, one of you said that uh, he is working on uh, state estimation for network systems. It's also very, very interesting. Um, I don't remember who. It was me. No. Uh, who was it? Uh, me, Antonello. Antonello, yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Again, many challenging challenges arising from computation time because we have to deal with now a network system. Um, 
a large system, we can say, and the communications uh, bring also some uh, drawbacks with them. We, of course, they have also their advantages, but also drawbacks we have to deal with. And the problems are feasibility that we get a solution. And if we get a solution, uh, as always, first you look for a solution, then you look for the quality of uh, the solution. Here are some examples of, uh, of network uh, systems. Uh, you know all of them, maybe you have uh, seen group of drones or traffic or also um, yeah, um, aligned energy park is also a network system. So here we see uh, some examples of contribution to better perception and decision-making. Um, we start with the example on the left-hand side. I'll explain the example first. Here, vehicle number one is driving from south to north on the right lane, right? Vehicle two is standing, so it's not moving. And vehicle three is moving from north to south. A pedestrian is going to cross the street behind vehicle number two. And the sensors of vehicle number three detects the pedestrian, right? And vehicle number one, or the sensors of vehicle num number one, don't see the pedestrian because he is or she behind vehicle number two. So vehicle number three tells of a communication, vehicle number one, there is a pedestrian and the pedestrian is at position X and Y. And now vehicle number one can update uh, the object list, the environment model and uh, yeah, with the help of vehicle number three, vehicle number one could extend its uh, visibility, let's say. Uh, this is a contribution to better perception. And this is a typical example in, uh, in terms of traffic for contribution to better perception. It is the typical example you, you see. Okay, and uh, the example for decision-making, also the typical example is uh, an intersection. So we have an intersection, vehicles are driving towards the intersection, they have their goals and they have to coordinate. Of course, here we assume autonomous vehicles, right? and they can communicate. So they coordinate to uh, pass the intersection safely, means no collisions happen. And uh, maybe they look at also at uh, efficiency. They just, uh, the, the goal is not just to be safe. I mean, to be safe, we can stop all vehicles and they are safe. So one goal of the goal of safety is not enough. We need also a second goal uh, of efficiency. Maybe the efficiency is in not just in terms of time, but also in terms of uh, energy. So some or one of you uh, said tomorrow, I think Ivan is working on electric vehicles. Yeah, and one goal in electric vehicles, especially if we have uh, hybrid vehicles or let's say French extenders uh, in the electric vehicles is to uh, minimize the energy uh, consumption or 
to operate uh, the combustion engine in uh, optimal operating mode. Yeah, whatever. So energy saving is also uh, a goal. Right. So here again, our lovely example of pedestrians, but now network thinking, not pedestrian walking, but pedestrians walking as networked MPC and uh, not more as MPC, but as networked MPC. And again here, pedestrians walking, networked MPC, the task for every pedestrian, again, for every pedestrian. Follow the line means reference. You know it from MPC. Act as little as possible is the control input. You know it. Consider physical and logical limits, other constraints. Um, yeah, the plan, use discrete model to anticipate your movement for two steps. Here, for simplicity, I changed the, changed the five steps to two steps, just for simplicity. Fine. Consider your physical, means body limits, yeah, model as uh, constraint. Yeah, here it was about uh, prediction and prediction horizon. And now consider physical and logical limits of your action position orientation as inputs and state constraints. Till now, it is the MPC. The new one, and this is uh, the coupling between pedestrians, and this is the network, don't collide with each other. This is the only condition here in this example. We tell the pedestrians just don't collide with each other. And in plan, <coughs> yeah, plan your action for one step. This is the control horizon. And here again, I set the control horizon to one for simplicity. So remember, HP is two, HU is one, here, right? And again, if we were in the room, I would pick up two of you to uh, walk on online uh, and uh, we will discuss uh, your coordination. And I would ask uh, you to do things and we will repeat the game three times to consider different options. And uh, we repeat also the game with a third player to show you the effects of, uh, of more players. Yeah, but here I'll play the game uh, for you. So it doesn't make sense that you play now the, the game uh, that I assign players Yeah, so case number one, or I explain the setting here first. Here we have player number one, and player number one is looking in this direction from west to east, and also moving. And we assume also constant velocity uh, from west to east, and player two. Number two is moving from east to west and also with a constant velocity. Right? So two pedestrians. The positions are defined. They are moving towards each other. Again, for um, Remind HP is, I said two, and HU is one, right? 
So in, in the room, I would tell player number one that, okay, before that, I would continue here. So here is the current position of player number one, and here is the current position of player number two. Here we see the predictions, possible predictions of player number two, right? Uh, I chose here for simplicity, uh, discrete changes of position here perpendicular to, uh, to these points, right? And the same, holds for player number one. Here is the position of player number one. And in the next step, player number one could be here, here, or here. In the next step again, here, here, or here, and so on. Fine. And now to illustrate the, the problem, I would tell player number one that avoidance is only possible to the right, right? And I would tell player number two that avoidance of collision with player number one is only possible to the left, right? That means you can see I would cause a collision in in the room between two of you. So number one is moving in this direction and from uh, the view of player number one is just possible to move to the right, to avoid to the right. That means I uh, cancel the possibility to, to move upwards, right? And for player number two, I tell them, I tell him or her to move to, or that avoidance is just only possible to the left. That means also I cancel this possibility and we will see what, uh, what happens. So uh, player number one will now predict so two steps, that means predict uh, in step number one, I numbered here the, the steps for each player. I will be at this point and in the next step, I will be, be there, right? So I maybe change the colors. So this is a prediction now. The current position is in red. And again, for player number two, the same. So do you see a problem? No, there is no problem, right? There is no collision between the two players due to their predictions. So right, then we can move. So now player number one is at this position and player number two is at this position, right? Now we repeat again. I will use the same uh, color code. So number one predicts Number two predicts also, and we see here that the prediction of one and two collide here at point number three. So here there is a problem for both of, of the players. So player number one, because I, told him or her, you are just allowed to move to the right. 
and the control horizon is just one, right? So number one would change to this point. And because the control horizon is just one, he or she is not allowed to come back to, to the reference. Right? The straight lines are the reference. So the next point will be here. And this is the solution now of player number one. So the solution of player number two will be also the same. Here is the solution and it's not allowed to um, to it's not allowed to uh, just allowed to to avoid to to the left so this is also the solution there is no other solution and they collide again right so now they don't uh, they don't have other choice than moving to to the next point and we'll change the colors again so now one moves and two moves and now both of, both of them uh, predict that they can go back to, to the reference. Means this is the prediction of player number two, and this is the prediction of player number one, right? Because from the last time step, if you remember, both of the players thought that they will continue in the bottom here. So now in this step, both of them think I can go back to the reference because they want to be on the reference, right? So we, again, in MPC, we minimize the distance, the error between our state and the reference. Well, they, uh, each of, of them moves now to this point and a collision will happen. That means there is a problem, right? Could you understand it? Could you, could you understand uh, what is happening here and why the collision couldn't be avoided? Because the control uh, horizon is uh, is not is only one. If it's uh, bigger, maybe they can predict other position to anticipate to coming back to the reference. Uh, yeah, you're you're right. Uh, it depends on on the parameters, but <coughs> I'm choosing this. This is an example I'm choosing to show you a symmetry here and to show you the, um, the problem. Um, of course, um, if or accidentally, if the prediction horizons or control horizons are different, we could go to solutions, but we don't know but we want to systematically go to solutions, right? And this is a constructed example. Okay. I have one question. Yeah, uh, Dennis. So you mentioned that they, uh, player one was not allowed to go to the left or was that just a state constraint indicated by the red line? Because now the, in the first prediction of the control of the prediction horizon, the first step, it's immediately to the left. 
the first red or the first green circle that's to the left of the red one for player one. And maybe I didn't get your point. Maybe you hmm. say it again. So in the current drawing, um, we have a red circle for uh, player one, where it's at the current step. And then there's a green circle to the left of it. But okay, okay. I mean, yeah, to, to the right means here, uh, not always to, to move right. to the right, uh, means just that, uh, that player number one can go on straight or on the bottom li line. Ah, okay. Okay, yeah. yeah. I, ex I just excluded this area. Yeah, so that is just a state constraint. Yeah, yeah, you can okay. implement it as a state constraint, right? Yeah. yeah, this is the first setting. And now we go to the second one. You, you may think here of, of a solution. Or what, what would be your solution here? Um, either both they should stop if for, <laughs> if, 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 for ex, if for example uh, the control input is the acceleration the longitudinal acceleration so it should be zero so both of them would stop or uh, there is no solution yeah stopping is very good is uh, really a good solution um, it is actually the invariant but we don't want really to stop. We want, we want to keep moving. So uh, the, the rule you know from, from traffic is uh, the, the right-hand side. So move always on the right, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I will show you that it will, uh, how it will work or not work. So I'll tell here player number one that movement or changing from the reference is allowed just to, to the right. And player number two, I will also tell it's just allowed to the right. So for player number two, these points don't exist. And for player number one, these points don't exist. So I can see like this and like this, right? And we we will play again. H P is two, H U is one. Well. <clears throat> Which colors I used, or oh, no matter. Maybe red, right? These are the current positions. Here, which color I chose? Green. Predictions. Right, no problem. Player number two will move. I have to change the color. This was the old prediction. The same for player number one will move. And now we have a new situation, right? So now let us look at the predictions. The prediction of player number one is this. The prediction of player number two is this and they see a problem in, uh, in the prediction, right? And now they are allowed to change in the control horizon, which means that player number one, so this is the solution of player number one, right? And here, this is the solution. Solution of player number two is this, 
right? So now we have uh, solutions for board and board can, can now move. So they exchange the plans, they exchange their plans and move. So they, uh, both of players know the plan of the other player from this time step. Do you see the point? Now, player number one tells player number two, this is my plan. Number two tells number one, this is my plan. And they, they move. Let me change the colors. So here is number two. Here is player number one. And these were where the predictions. Yeah, now again, the predictions are these. They should not come back to the reference. I mean, uh, th these are the predictions. Uh, now the control comes. Both of them want to go back to, uh, to the reference, what you said. So they use their control in the control horizon and they go back to, uh, to the reference. So player number one moves to the reference. Player number two decides the same. And again, we have a collision. So you see that there is no solution here, right? Uh, in the first example, I showed you uh, that here in example number one, I showed you if they are not coordinated and I tell them, uh, I force them to, to go to the wrong uh, direction from the perspective of the other, they will collide. And you, you may think, ah, okay, why we, we don't coordinate and tell each of them go to the right and we will have a solution. And now you see that uh, a solution may not exist also. And this is due to not the network, due to uh, this delay in the communication between, between both. They both plan, communicate, plan again, communicate, plan again. And both of them plan with the plan of the other player from the last time step. So this is what, I, what now sounds uh, complicated is the network thinking. <laughs> So you will get to uh, used to it in during this lecture and tomorrow. I am I am sure after uh, lately tomorrow in the in the evening you will have the network thinking. So in the third example, I am not going to do it, but uh, usually I tell the people do whatever you want, and you will not get to a solution. Right. And um, yeah, <laughs> this is what we did now with two pedestrians. Uh, maybe you have experienced or observed, uh, probably not during Corona, uh, because maybe you are staying at home. But if you live in a crowded city and you go to uh, the shopping street or mall or whatever, and maybe after Corona, you can observe it. two pedestrians approach each other. They avoid each other once, avoid each other twice, and they may collide or not collide. It's uh, in some cases funny what happens, in some cases not funny. It depends on, uh, on the mood of the people, right? And uh, maybe you, uh, yeah, maybe you observe the next time you you go to, to Japan, to Tokyo, in the Shibuya crossing. I went there 
and you can observe how uh, such a crowded place with so many people crossing uh, the streets uh, work, but not always. So they, in, in Japan, it, it works very well. Maybe on Saturday in our city, it not <laughs> always work very well because people are also sometimes not willing to, to move. They just ignore each other, right? <laughs> So it is sometimes also a problem of perception. And think of extending this example to end pedestrians. And this is the network thinking, and this is what I want to transfer to you to today and tomorrow. And to get into the network thinking, I would uh, now play a game with you. And the game is very easy. So I give you some seconds to think about a solution and I'll tell you after the seconds uh, what you should do. So the, uh, the task is choose a number between one and hundred, any number, and the winner of you, so we will have a winner at the end of the day, is the closest to one half of average. So we will take the numbers, we will compute the average, compute the half of the average, and the closest of you to the one half of the average will win. So take some seconds to think about a solution. And I will come back to you in some seconds. Okay, I think this is uh, enough. Yeah, just go to the chat, put your number there, and don't click on send. I don't want that you change your numbers depending on the others. Just put your number there, and uh, if you have put your number there, I would say now send. I'm, I'm expecting 15, right? 15 numbers. So now, Patrick, you can tell me the numbers. 57. I couldn't understand you. Uh, 57. My mic not, not working. 57, OK. 35, 6, 28, 1, 25, 25, 35, 10, 23, 51, 15, 61. All right, this is uh, round number one. So the winner will be the closest to, maybe I should. Uh, I think there is also just, number Just 10. a second because my computation is wrong here. I think, I think someone also wrote number 10. Yeah. Say it again. So this one should be 35 and 53. Looks good. Now it's good. Oh, the last one, I forgot. Uh, another 10, yeah. It's 10 oh, here. Yeah. No, uh, an additional 10. So 61 and then 10. Oh, okay, fine. Well, now you see the solution. The solution is 14.3 maybe. Um, I would like to play now the game again with you. Please have some seconds. Think about a solution. Okay, if you have decided, click on send. Okay. So we have seven, eight, 25, 12, 15, nine, 20, five, five, 19, 34, 23, 15, and 20. Ah, fine. <laughs> so
So I don't need to play around number three with you because you hopefully already seen that the trend is going to zero, right? If we continue playing this game until infinity, then the solution, um, all of your solutions would be, would be zero and all of you will win the last round. But first, be, before we continue, I would ask who is the closest to 13.6? Is it 10? It's the half of the average, so it's six. It is, no? it is 15, right? Here? Yeah. Yeah, the winner is who types 15. 15, out yourself. That's me, of course. I calculated it. <laughs> ah, Maximilian. Okay, explain, please. No, it was just uh, in my guts. <laughs> ah, okay, without deep thinking. Yeah, it was just an, an assumption. At first, I would go with one or zero, but uh, yeah, just for the fun of it, I typed 15. Ah, okay, uh, then we take the next closest is 10. We have two tens, right? Am I right? Yeah, we have two tens. Yeah, uh, one of the ten. Maybe you want to explain why you choose ten. Uh, one was me. Yeah. And well, I start to think that after some steps, it will converge to one. So I just put the. Uh, one small values to make it converge faster. <laughs> you understand? Uh, not exactly. You think that it will converge to one? Yes, because uh, we can choose uh, from one to 100 and the half win. So after a few steps, uh, everyone will uh, choose always the average, uh, the half of the average. So after some step, uh, the, the best choice, the convergence choice will be one or one small values. Okay, it is allowed to choose number, numbers between zero and 100, not one? Uh, well, yes, so. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, you thought about the next steps, right? Mm -mm. What will yes. happen? And the other thing, why? Actually, it was me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Say that. And uh, it was a kind of blind guess. Oh, okay. <laughs> so sorry for that. <laughs> I put a question mark uh, next to my number, but uh, so it was not calculated. So okay, maybe we get uh, an explanation explanation of round number two uh, from the next is maybe eight. I hope a different player. Mm -mm, it's me. Okay, Julia, go ahead. I, I thought that uh, this time the, the mean, uh, uh, it will be, of course, uh, um, less than uh, the first one. So I saw that it was 14 and I tried to put something around eight or seven and I put eight because I guess that it, uh, uh, the convergence will be a, a very, um, uh, a, a value pro approximately uh, near to zero or one. Okay, okay. Um, uh, this is smart and how about seven? Yeah, hi. So I was I was assuming that in the next round uh, the yeah the the winner would be round about the half of of the previous round. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, also smart. So uh, yeah, I maybe show you what the students of my course chose. 
it is similar, right? You see it was the half of average was around 15 and it was in the second round also around six. So it is similar in uh, um, one year before it was also similar in the first round is what well, it was near to 12. And um, usually if you choose uh, big enough, the, a group big enough, then uh, you will have in the first round, if the people don't know the game, and a half of average of 12.5. So if you, if you want to, if you have a large group and want to play the game and test this theory, you can, of course, do it. Um, I want just to close here. Okay, maybe here. So the half of the average is almost 12.5. And what, uh, what happens? Uh, we are looking at, uh, at one half of the average. So one half of, of the average, uh, if, you, if you think it is always below 50, right? This is always true. And usually people think, ah, okay, the half of the average is 50. People would put 50, I would put 25. And most of people put 25 and then the solution is 12.5. And in, in such groups, they, is always somebody who put a number uh, close to 12.5. And yeah, if we continue playing, we will converge to, uh, to zero. And maybe if you had a course on, on game theory, the zero is the Nash equilibrium. So this course, our course here is not about game theory. It is uh, just about or I chose this example just for uh, showing you the network thinking and how to uh, how the single agents in this case you influence each other. Yeah, this example is taken from a course in game theory, <clears throat> right? So the decision quality of individuals affected by decisions of others. So your decisions affected each other. And this game has a name. The name is Beauty Contest. And it comes from American newspaper. Uh, they published some characters, maybe three, and they asked the people, okay, uh, choose the prettiest one, but not in your opinion, which is chosen by the majority as the prettiest one. So people should start think, okay, if I now choose the prettiest one from my opinion, maybe it is not the prettiest one from the opinion of other. And the other think, think that the same. So you can also continue thinking what I think, what, uh, what you think, and what I think about the average and what the average think about the average and, and so on. And uh, similar things happen at the stock market. So you shouldn't uh, buy the stocks uh, which you think, ah, okay, they are the best, but what the most of people think it, uh, I don't know exactly in stock market, we should buy what the most of people think are the best. Okay, which will have the best opportunity and it depends on, uh, on how the people buy them. So if many people buy, then uh, the price will, uh, will, will increase, right? So it is uh, about attractivity. You should buy the attractive, uh, stocks but at the right time before the other people start buying right and 
at I I have a question. Sorry Hi. for interrupting. Um, so why was the average twelve and a half? I mean, if everyone thinks in this way, then we would all end up in one or zero, uh, probably zero. Um, so it it depends on how many iterations you want to make on what the average thinks, right? Right, and um, this is a smart uh, comment for this comment. <laughs> so Keynes in the last century uh, yeah, studied this and maybe I'll read the last sentence of it. Uh, and there are some, I believe, who practice the fourth, fifth, and higher degrees of thinking. And what you did uh, is the, okay, maybe, maybe I start here. We have reached the third degree where we devote our intelligences to anticipating what average opinion expects the average opinion to be, right? And there are some, I believe, who practice the fourth, fifth, and higher degrees. So if you continue, but uh, this this goes also in, in the in the estimation. Uh, how do you estimate uh, that the other estimate? So how how do you estimate the uh, the intelligence of of other people? And um, Keynes said that. Uh, we arrived at the third level and there are some practicing the fourth and fifth level. It's really complicated thinking, it's not easy. So uh, this is something something for intelligent people. <laughs> so okay, I so suggest is... that you read this Wikipedia um, article about the beauty contest, so you will understand more about it. Yeah, Dennis, you want to say something? Yeah, so this is just an average intelligence estimate for these kind of games that you put there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So if you, you continue thinking also about it, uh, in if you think about the second round of our game, so Julia uh, and uh, who also use it, I think, uh, thought, okay, uh, in the next round, uh, maybe the the other would rather say 12.5 or around 12, and I would say the half, and I will win. And it was the right estimation. But if you assume that you are playing with a group of really intelligent people, all of them, then you should directly write zero. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, but if you, uh, if you would continue thinking and write zero, and the solution is not zero, then you, you, you were not smart enough, right? So if you you have to assume that the other people are, are smart to write zero, but uh, your assumption should be also right. When I played the game the first time. I typed zero, but I was wrong. I didn't win, <laughs> right? So because I thought, ah, okay, iterations, no problem. I can iterate and iterate it till zero, but it was wrong. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> and related to this, there is uh, a nice movie, A Beautiful Mind. Uh, it is uh, about uh, Nash, the um, yeah, the famous John Nash. He won uh, also, I think, the, uh, the Nobel Prize. Yeah. So I would suggest if you have time next week, not this week, this week you don't have time, you have to work in the lab. If you have time next week, I would suggest to, uh, to watch this movie. It's really nice and you would understand more about uh, network thinking. 
but now I would continue in our network thinking. And now coming to uh, a current situation, the COVID-19 pandemic. And here is uh, a modeling of, uh, of the pan pandemic, not really of the pandemic, of our reaction to the pandemic, what we should do. So uh, X is the state, is the number of infected people in the day before Corona started, the number of infected people was zero, right? It was uh, more than one year ago. And I'm assuming a country with a population of 80 million, it is <laughs> Germany, around 80 million. You can replace the 80 by the number of population in your country. And I is the index of uh, the population. So it is uh, just a number of the population. And the control action at a time T for every individual is to be infected or not infected. Right? Uh, of course, this is a simplification. I am writing the COVID-19 uh, on, on one slide. It is really a simplification, but uh, I want just to initiate the network thinking in your mind. So here we have our model, xt plus one is xt plus rn, and rn is the rate of uh, people getting infect infected. So maybe you, uh, you have read or heard about uh, this number r, so num the, the rate of infections uh, should be below uh, one and there are mathematical models that then the pandemic ends and so on. Yeah. Well, uh, the rate of new infections is Rn times Xt T minus the R out, the rate of people getting out of the system means uh, they, uh, they are not infected anymore or maybe unfortunately died. And uh, Rn times Xt is the sum of infected people. The sum of all, but all are zero or one. One is infected, so it is the sum of the infected people at a time t. And the task is, uh, <laughs> before saying it, because it's weird, is the task or the goal is to maintain to, to maintain uh, life running, to maintain maybe economy running, right? And for this, this is the weird modeling. You shouldn't model like, like this, but uh, this is just a fast solution. We want to maximize the number of infected people, right? Uh, here you see that the sum of infected people, we want to maximize them. But subject two, we have uh, a condition on this that the number or the rate of people who need uh, um, uh, intensive medicine or intensive bed, we say also in, uh, in this sense, the rate of, of them times the new infections should be less or equal 3000 at all time steps, which means here, we don't want to stop the pandemic. We want to maintain life. We want to continue life. Everything is, is fine, but we don't want to stress our medical system. We want to keep our medical system also working, not just 
the economy should work, but also the medical system. And uh, yeah, I chose here 3,000 because uh, I assume that every day uh, we, we can host 3,000 and they stay. Uh, I, I don't remember how, what, what number I, I've assumed. They, they stay for some days in the, uh, in the hospital and they leave and uh, new people can come. And uh, so you have to, to compute how, how many beds do, do you have and how many can you host per day and assume here we can host in Germany 3,000 per day. I don't know exactly, it's uh, just an assumption. So and uh, you see here, this is what uh, at least now is happening, uh, at least in our region here in uh, in Aachen. Uh, yeah, they are now opening the stores and uh, um, the trend is going to uh, to close the lockdown. And what people think, okay, I I want to belong to the people who, who are free now, who can uh, move free, who can go shopping, who can go to restaurant and so on. And what is happening with the number of infections, it's, other, it's uh, increasing. But, and now you, you see the, uh, the effect of, uh, of networks and the effect of network thinking and how you can think of such a system. Again, this is uh, a simplified modeling of, of the pandemic. So if you would think about the pandemic as MPC, maybe you could discuss also of the effect of the prediction horizon. Just for you, maybe you can discuss with your teammate later in during the lab exercises. I mean, we have now some knowledge about uh, uh, yeah about the the pandemic, about Corona, about how many days people are usually uh, infected, how many days they can infect people, how many uh, need intensive medicine, and and so on. And you can consider these or assume numbers to look for right prediction horizons. And you, you will see that you need a prediction horizon of at least two weeks, because what if people get infected today, we see the symptoms two weeks later. So this is uh, just an assumption of two weeks. In some cases, it's 10 days I heard, I don't know exactly, I uh, don't follow uh, each uh, new news of, of Corona daily. So there is also a new variant of Corona now. I think it, uh, if I remember right, the symptoms come after two weeks. Fine. And how can we model such a system? Usually using graphs. Graphs are a powerful tool for modeling and analyzing network systems. So if you want to uh, have a very fast introduction to graphs, just read these three pages. And uh, actually, I don't want to go through definitions with you, but I just want to, to say what is a graph. A graph is a pair of vertices and edges. And yeah, the vertices we draw usually here are circles and the edges are the connections between the circles. And there are directed and undirected graphs. Uh, again, the vertices is a set of 
is a, a mathematical set and the uh, edges are also a mathematical set. Edges are always a pair of, uh, of vertices, right? Well, for example, here we could say it is H A C, the edge from A to C, it depends on the definition of, of the deduction. So maybe I can uh, directly start with an example explaining graphs. Uh, we can, or usually traffic networks are modeled as graphs. So the streets are the vertices and the connections between the streets are the edges. And we need in, uh, in such uh, root networks also directions because we have also one ways uh, connections between streets where, where we say, okay, we can go in, in one of the directions as the name says, one-way streets. Yeah, and uh, such graphs are used for navigation. All of you have used something like Google Maps or a navigation system to, uh, to compute a route, yeah, right? So how such uh, routes are computed, I don't want to go into detail, but a suggestion for you, it is a very famous algorithm. And if you don't know the algorithm, I would suggest that you go and learn it. It is uh, a basic algorithm in computer science and in graph theory. Uh, the Dijkstra algorithm, Dijkstra is from the Netherlands. Uh, yeah, and he uh, he's a famous computer scientist. Uh, and he suggested an algorithm for computing the shortest paths between nodes in, in graphs. Uh, nodes, by the way, is uh, just other word for vertex. Yeah, and his algorithm is optimal because he can, he proved that using his algorithm, we always find the optimal solution, the optimal uh, shortest or the optimal shortest is other than the redundancy, the shortest path between nodes in, in graphs. So there are, after his algorithm appeared, some people suggested uh, some improvements of the computation time, but the basic idea is uh, still the same. So if you, the next time, uh, use your maps to compute a route. Remember, it is uh, a graph running in the background, maybe on the server of Google or the provider in general. And um, yeah, they model streets and the connections between the streets. And here the numbers you see on, uh, on the edges, uh, the, we call them weights. So it is the weight or cost of connection between A and C. It is 1.3. If we want to go from A to B, it is one. And from A to D, it is 2.5 and so on. So if you uh, have learned the algorithm, then you can go through this example and uh, see how the from slide to slide how the algorithm works. But maybe I will jump here directly to the solution. Yeah, and here we, we see the, the, the solution. If we want to go uh, from A to E, the best way is to go to B to D to E, as you see in, in this solution. Right, and if you think, ah, okay, maybe I could go over F from D, F, E. Ah, you see directly it is costly or it costs more. It costs 2.2 in comparison to 
uh, the two from D to E. So you see, uh, yeah, the red connections are the really the shortest connections between the nodes here. Yeah, and now we continue with network model predictive control. And here are some pages for reading. So NCS consists of interacting agents. We call them dynamic subsystems. And here are some definitions in NCS or how we classify NCS. This is uh, the way we suggest in our group. So we suggest that there are passive agents. Passive agents are dynamic subsystems without network control. If we look at traffic, they are non-autonomous vehicles, but they can communicate to active agents. So they, uh, they have somehow to tell the active agents that they are there. And this communication, especially this, this con communication shouldn't be uh, real wireless communication between vehicles, for example. Could be also uh, the perception system of the active agent. So the active agent could detect the passive agent here. So in each case, the active agents should have knowledge about the passive agents. So now active agents, or we, uh, we say just agents in general, they exchange data. They achieve their goals while taking the interaction with other agents into consideration, the network. And they have full knowledge about passive agents and their future states, or estimate, or whatever. Yeah, and this classification of agents is can be considered as a step to full automation of NCS and for consideration of non-autonomous or non-automotable uh, agents. So in such network control system, we have to deal with communication. Communication has restrictions, for example, time delay. The example of pedestrians walking, right? Uh, we don't just have delays in communications, we have also packet drops, data losses. Not every uh, information sent arrives, right? And uh, we deal with uh, computation time. The computation time could be high, depending on how we compute and how huge or large is our system. Both communication and computation affect the stability and performance of uh, a network control system. And additionally, this is also an important point for you to know, we distinguish between time invariant and time variant network. Means uh, in simple words, you find in my thesis a definition, uh, time invariant, the uh, communication or the coupling between the agents is constant and uh, the, the, the objectives couplings or the constraints coupling, we, we will discuss them during uh, maybe, maybe more tomorrow. They are also constant. In such case, we speak about time, time invariant coupling or time invariant network. And we have also time variant networks, which is as you know uh, from classical control, time variant, time invariant systems, uh, time variant are uh, more hard to deal with. 
So here is uh, a classification we did in, in my group to uh, somehow classify, classify network control systems. And we divided the approaches to deal with network control systems into system level, control level, and algorithm level. It's just our definition. And I go through these uh, parts in a minute. But first, uh, I would like to define a control strategy. A control strategy is a combination of a control method and the algorithm applied to it. So control plus algorithm is control strategy. It's just our definition here. And the selection of the control strategy depends on the categories in the system level. You will see in a minute what this means. It depends on the available computation time. Computation time is always a topic. Computation, communication. Communication, computation is always the, the topic in network systems. Yeah, and it depends on the communications requirements. So I would like to arise your attention about uh, the computation time. The computation time is the time required for the whole NCS to reach a solution at a given time step, right? So it is, we measure states, we formulate and solve our optimization problem, we apply the inputs to all, to all agents and communicate the required data. And here a hint, the sequence of these steps depends on the control strategy. Here, these steps are not a sequence, just a list, right? This is important to know. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, uh, you said that uh, the computation time is uh, the time to, to take to solve the optimization and to get the control input and to feed it to all the agents. It means uh, in here, but this it depends on the architecture. So in here, we, it's like we are, uh, we are making a centralized control architecture. I mean, me at the beginning, I, uh, when I saw the word networked, I thought that we have uh, a lot, each agent has its own MPC and its own control input. And uh, for the other, uh, the other information will, will just be like, um, in order to define the environments and to set uh, the constraints. But like that, it's gonna be very heavy if we, if we have a multiple system. Yeah, you're right, totally right. Uh, you are uh, still listening <laughs> to me. I'm happy. So what uh, your question uh, we are going to deal with during today and tomorrow. So we okay. are going to deal mainly with distributed systems, right? And okay. what, what you see here uh, belongs to distributed systems. So the network, so, yeah? For, um, I, I forgot the distinction between centralized and distributed. Distributed, it means we have uh, the, that control input is gonna be distributed to all the agents. This no? is going to be the topic of uh, maybe more tomorrow than today. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Thank don't you. worry, we are going to, uh, to deal with. Okay. Right. So, but today I would like to go through the classification with you and then we take the break and get back to the lab work. So first in the classification on the system level, we divide uh, a network control system depending on the dynamics. We divide the dynamics into heterogeneous and homogeneous. If, if you look at uh, the vehicles, for example, uh, the vehicles in our lab are homogeneous, are all the same, have the same dynamics. Heterogeneous if we have different dynamics. Uh, it depends on the people, what, uh, how they define heterogeneous and homogeneous. You find different uh, definitions in literature, but in, uh, in general, uh, 
yeah, in, in general, if the dynamics are different, they speak about heterogeneous dynamics. For example, if we have uh, a platoon with different uh, weights of the, of the vehicles, then people speak about heterogeneous platoon. Uh, other people say, okay, heterogeneous if I have completely other dynamics, for example, vehicles and aerial vehicles. So maybe road and aerial vehicles. So the next step is to look at the coupling between the agents and we look at dynamically decoupled agents. Uh, dynamically decoupled means that the agents are not physically coupled with each other, but we couple them uh, for, for our interest, for, for a certain target, goal, what, uh, whatever, how you define it. So vehicles are dynamically decoupled, or an example for dynamically decoupled agents, because uh, if you, for example, I just gave you an example to think about the coupling. If you accelerate in one vehicle, the other vehicles don't accelerate or brake automatically, right? So there is no physical coupling between the accelerations of, of vehicles. In contrast, dynamically coupled is, for example, for control engineers, very famous example, the three tank example. So three tank, you know, is coupled. If I put water in the first tank, it will flow to the second and to the third, and uh, it's a coupling system or coupled system. So now we look at the control level, and we look here in our course just at networked MPC, not at uh, other control methods. And we distinguish here between centralized, distributed, and decentralized control. Centralized, if all agents get, uh, no, if a center gets information of all agents, compute a solution, sends back the solution to the agents, and they apply, then it is centralized. So we are going to speak in more detail about it. Uh, now, just an overview. We speak about distributed if there is no coordinator, there is no center, the agents communicate directly with each other, and there is also communication between agents. So this is uh, our definition of distributed. There is uh, also decentralized control, and in our definition, control is decentralized if there is no communication between, uh, between the agents. You may see other definitions in, in literature. I'm aware of that. There are different definitions in literature. If you move uh, to the optimization community, the, optim the definitions are different from the control community. And inside the communities, you find different definitions. So I just uh, took a definition. Definition um, should just make uh, make sense for, for you. So, and uh, of course should uh, be understandable by the community. But there, there is no standard about this. And in distributed control, we distinguish between cooperative and non-cooperative. This will be the topic of, of tomorrow, but in the lab work, you are going to apply the priority base and the other options are sequential or parallel. So in distributed, the agents can compute sequentially one after the other, or they can compute in parallel. And tomorrow I will show you the advantages and disadvantages, uh, not just advantages and disadvantages, but also problems happen uh, due to the computation uh, order. And they can iterate or not, or not iterate. So it could be iterative or non-iterative, the algorithm. And uh, what I'm going to show you tomorrow and what you are going to apply in, in the lab is the priority base. 
which is uh, non-iterative and it is a hybrid between sequential and parallel, right? So it is uh, a method developed and applied in, in my group and also in the lab, and I would like you to implement it in uh, during the exercises. So what uh, network model predictive control is all about is to reducing computation time and communications, and we want to enhance visibility and quality of control, right? Reduce computation time and communication, get feasible solution, and ask of the quality of this solution. I just take a look at the next slide. Okay, we stop at this point, go to the break, and meet again at four for the lab work to continue working in the lab. Um, yeah, tomorrow I continue uh, the network part. So get enough coffee. I need some coffee also. And see you in 20 minutes. <laughs>